Hello and welcome to my talk here at the Aerospace Village at DEF CON SIG MODE. MITM, the mystery in the middle. My name is Matthew Gaffney and I'll be taking you through uh, an introductory level talk of, about the Aircraft Information Systems Domain, uh, also known as the AISD. We'll be covering through these topics uh, throughout the uh, 50 minutes or so talk today. Um, covering most of it on EFBs, if I'm honest. So, um, why the mystery? Um, so, the reason I, I said I call it the mystery in the middle uh, was uh, due to the lack of public information I could find about the AISD when I started my journey into aviation cybersecurity uh, several years ago. I could find lots out about hacking avionics systems, uh, IFE, and all about their weaknesses, but very little about the AISD. So that's the reason, the main reason for the talk today is to try and improve knowledge and awareness of this part of the aircraft um, and generate the, the healthy discussion about security within. So logically, the AISD sits in between the aircraft control domain and the passenger information and entertainment systems domain, both known as the ACD and the PIESD. And essentially what makes um, an aircraft uh, what's known as E-enabled. And E-enabled means that it, um, it will integrate, uh, the aircraft will integrate with the airline IT systems. Uh, to provide significant cost savings to the business. And what it does is it allows remote maintenance and uploading of software updates, which is a key time saver, especially when you consider that uh, previously, if you wanted to update the firmware on a module, you'd have to remove it, send it away. Uh, in the meantime, put in a replacement, then get the old unit back with the new firmware and swap it over. Um, so being able to upload uh, new software remotely without having to remove uh, modules or LRUs as they're known uh, is a considerable cost and time saving for an airline. It also allows the airline to uh, download uh, logs, both uh, operational logs and security. Um, so for airlines, the AISD is the most important part to get right for the business. At least that's my view of the way. An airline cannot have much influence on how the ACD is constructed. That may be a small amount of customization, but not very much at all. Uh, it's heavily regulated. It's heavily um, dependent on certifications, which are long, expensive, and time consuming. Um, so the AISD is where the airline the operator really has to get it right. Um, but there's lots of challenges in doing that. There's, uh, across all aviation, not just enabled aircraft, there's a lot of older technology that gets reused. And it's not really a surprise because if it works and it meets the requirements, why change it? Uh, certifying new modules is expensive and time consuming as well. So the older modules that are still fit for purpose will be reused a lot because it's cheaper to modify them or to use the old ones. What this also means though, is that um, when threats change over time, these older modules uh, can be attacked in new ways nobody thought about when they were conceived. We're seeing this with avionics hardware today, um, uh, but we are not um, really thinking about this when it comes to the AISD and maybe we should. When I say we have new risks to manage, what I mean is engineering now needs to consider cyber and infosec risks. Infosec teams now need to understand and consider engineering. Traditionally, these are two areas of the business that have been completely isolated. And it has allowed engineering to operate in its own little bubble, um, which has led to engineering not following infosec policy 100%. And you see examples of bad practice, such as post-it notes with passwords, or even passwords being written into procedure documentation, because it's easier to operate that way when you're an engineer than it is to use a password manager or to remember the password off by heart. 
at the same time, IT and InfoSec are implementing systems for engineers to use without fully understanding the constraints of engineering. They don't always have really good 3G connection on board an aircraft. They don't always have time to be able to learn new systems in depth. What they do have um, is um, very pressured time constraints in order to get an uh, aircraft back on the line because all the time spent being fixed is money. But when IT comes along uh, and, and uh, comes along and implements a new IT system, say for example, they don't have single sign-on, um, all of a sudden that engineer, instead of 20 passwords to remember, they now have 21. And then we ask the question, why are they writing down passwords? So um, understanding the constraints and the difficulty of engineering can go a long way to improving the security posture of an airline. And operators really need to get these departments working together in harmony. When dealing with engineering and e-operations, you cannot bring the corporate information or cybersecurity mentality and templates to the party. They just won't work. You're dealing with an area of the business which historically has not been great with cyber. So you have to go slow. One thing that's on your side though, as a, an infosec person, is that aircraft engineers love processes and procedures. Oh boy, do they love them. Before you can even touch an aircraft on the ground, you must have a job card which outlines the steps engineers must, much, must take for each task. So if you can bring influence to these procedures to improve security, that's half the battle won. And then finally, um, I should probably explain that last comment on the slide. Um, this is my humble opinion, and I know many would disagree, uh, but I feel that when looking at aviation security, hackers should not focus entirely on avionics. Although the ACD and the avionics have a number of well-documented and technical weaknesses, it does have a very effective physical security model. You can only access the avionics bay from outside the aircraft. So when the aircraft is in flight, not even the pilots can get to it. So only the engineers on the ground can do that. And if you've ever tried to get access airside for legitimate reasons, you know how difficult it would be to get airside for illegitimate reasons. Also, there's usually only one network interface between the ACD and the AISD, and I'm talking about aircraft that are fully compliant with ARINC 821 here. But this separation is normally implemented with, with protections such as a firewall or even a data diode. And sometimes they also base that network communication on proprietary protocols, not on TCP IP. So if you can get into the ACD, yes, you can inflict a lot of damage, but gaining that access either through physical or technological means would be extremely difficult. And if you could go to that level, um, if you could get physical access to an aircraft, why go hacking? You know, you can do something much more nefarious with a much greater the guarantee of success uh, if that's what you wanted to do. So for me, instead, the aircraft information systems domain has multiple touch points ranging from the airline network Wi-Fi, even the internet, and the cabin. And these attack scenarios are much more traditional and realistic for a hacker, okay? It's not sexy, you can't control the, uh, the aircraft um, control services from the AISD, but you can have other effects on the aircraft. Effects which may impact operations, and if you know what you were doing, you could modify some of the data presented to the pilots. So um, manufacturer challenges. Uh, so I explained the challenge about technical debt. And, and the reason for that is that airworthiness timescales are huge and they um, okay. encourage um, or they, they, they almost force um, manufacturers to really think about what they're going to reuse and what they have to rebuild from scratch because those brand new modules um, are really expensive to get certified. Challenges from the operator um, 
are, are very different and um, in, in many ways are quite significant. Um, the key one is they have zero visibility of the manufacturer's risk assessment. So when the manufacturer is, is designing and building an aircraft, they perform extensive and detailed risk assessments uh, to mitigate system vulnerabilities. The, they will mitigate many of these issues themselves, but they will also transfer some to the operators. And this is communicated in a number of ways, um, such as security handbooks or ANSOGs, depending on which manufacturer you're dealing with. But no operator will get to see details of the original vulnerability or the risk assessment. So despite the quality of this manufacturer guidance and these uh, recommendations which come down, there's no real mechanism for the operator to assess the effectiveness of implemented controls. Um, and this can, and from what I have seen, probably does lead to, to gaps in the cybersecurity protections of e-enabled aircraft at the operator level. When you think about it, airlines, are heavily reliant on legacy IT systems. For example, many use uh, at the core of their business, a TPF system, which handles all of the real-time transactions. It's not a traditional operating system. It is based on technology that was released in 1979. To program it, it it's done in hexadecimal. It's, it's just not what we would, um, people in my generation, would consider uh, a traditional operating system. But it handles transaction message messages one-to-one -one at an extremely high volume and extremely high speed. And what that does is make sure that the same seat isn't booked twice by separate transactions milliseconds apart. So, and there's nothing out there on the market that can really replicate that right now. Also, airlines over time have grown. and uh, have added new systems on top of the old systems. And until quite recently, this may have been done without consideration of all the risks. In fact, some of them would have been done before cybersecurity was really a thing. Um, so some may not have followed good practice, such as network segregation. Uh, airlines also operate 24-7. And that means that outages are very costly. When uh, an airline IT system goes down, aircraft stop. Uh, they just cannot uh, take off because they haven't got the information they need for the pre-flight. So any introduction of a new system that could have an impact on operations is um, risk managed to the nth degree. And there's a lot of risk avoidance going on when these new systems are put in place. Either that, or you just throw resources at it to make sure that if something does go wrong when you introduce a new system, that the, the impacts are mitigated as much as possible. What it does mean is that over time, airlines can become quite flat in their networks. And what that means is if the perimeter is ever breached, it's very easy for an attacker to then pivot uh, inside the networks. So where regulators fit in, so speaking from an, a European perspective, um, there's some really positive steps going on right now um, in the uh, crit uh, critical national infrastructure sphere of which aviation forms a part of. And so, uh, maturity in cybersecurity, uh, aviation cybersecurity is growing slowly and gathering momentum, or at least it was before COVID. Uh, it was the last time I was really involved in it. Uh, from what I've seen, the UK CAA uh, is growing the oversight, uh, cyber oversight function in a very positive way. And rather than just setting out a framework and directing island, airlines to comply, they are working closely with operators instead, uh, guiding them and helping them through their assure process, which is really good to see, if I must admit. So going back to this gap in the risk assessment, um, could the regulator help bridge that gap? The issue with sharing the risk assessments with operators is they are highly sensitive. Maybe some trusted government bodies could be given more details on the risks 
and help guide operators on the effectiveness of their controls without passing on that sensitive detail. If we can't trust the government, what about the aviation ISAC? Although they are a member organization, most of the large operators and manufacturers are members. Could this be another suitable mechanism to do the same thing? Whatever happens, I feel something does need to be done. Uh, otherwise, pardon the pun, airlines could be flying flight. So here is a, a rather simplified overview of um, a e-enabled aircraft. Uh, this this uh, diagram is based on compliance to the ARIN 821 protocol. And as you can see, we've got the, the three main domains, the um, aircraft control domain, the aircraft information systems domain, and the passenger information and entertainment systems domain. The AISD, um, as well as being a main communications hub or hosting a main communications hub, uh, will host the uh, electronic flight bag if it's a class two. If it's a class two, the EFB will sit in the avionics. Uh, more on that later. Some aircraft have their flight attendant panel or FAP connected in the AISD. And there's also uh, occasionally printers, maintenance terminals, uh, which can be USB or Ethernet, Ethernet port. Uh, depending on what kind of device you're using, if you're using just a straight up USB as a tool, or if you're using a portable data loader. And um, those maintenance ports are used as a backup for the uh, IPSEC tunnels that sit between the aircraft and the ground system. So these, in, uh, these IPSEC tunnels are, are really well, uh, the security is excellent. Um, so they are uh, managed uh, from mostly on board but the ground systems are involved in the keying of the aircraft. Um, and there's, uh, I'll talk a bit more about uh, PKI later on. What we do have is um, the, uh, the EFBs, uh, if, uh, if they are connecting to the AISD, they will often route um, traffic to the internet uh, through the IPSEC tunnel, um, through the DMZ and out into the internet. Um, which is usually for software updates and, and is usually a very restricted set of websites where the EFB can go. Um, that is usually done on the ground as well because if you imagine if this is happening during the flight phase, you have the latency of the SATCOM connection down to the ground system through the DMZ and out to the internet. So the, the response time on that in flight would be pretty long. Uh, but on the ground, it's manageable. One thing to note as well is sometimes in e-enabled aircraft, instead of having a SAT come in the AISD, there is uh, an option whereby uh, the manufacturer uh, offers the operator uh, the ability to use the passenger SATCOM connection. So remember this, this SATCOM connection, the passenger domain, does not go through this EPSEC tunnel here it goes off through the service providers network. And uh, one option that um, some manufacturers are, are offering to operators is that the um, uh, information system domain here can connect uh, to the ground systems, but through the same SATCOM here. And that is quite advantageous in terms of cost. The, uh, the more you use SATCOM, the cheaper it is. So if you have two connections, that's gonna cost you quite a bit of money. If you have one, um, yes, you're gonna be paying for more data, but because prices come down with volume, you'll actually be paying less overall. What I have seen though is quite promising um, that the, uh, when this is implemented, the connection from the AISD into the SATCOM is through a separate VLAN. Um, so essentially that's a mini network segregation on its own there, and that data is not accessible from the IFE or the cabin Wi-Fi. So moving on to my favorite subject, electronic flight bags. So these have been a revolution for pilots. As the name suggests, they replace the large and cumbersome uh, and often heavy bags, which were used by pilots to carry paper-based manuals. Uh, 
these bags would often weigh more than 25 kilos. And as well as being um, difficult to maneuver, they also contributed to uh, physical injuries of pilots as well. Moving those bags around the cabin, around the uh, cabin, around the uh, cockpit, uh, sometimes led to shoulder injuries because of their weight. Depending on the type of EFB, they can perform a variety of functions, uh, including uh, a documentation reference library. They, a type B can perform uh, what's known as performance calculations. These give V1, VR, V2 speeds, all that kind of stuff. These are important for pilots to know. Uh, on route navigation, if you have a GNSS feed into the EFB, and if you have um, uh, the, the relevant connections, access to NOTAMs, weather information, and the ability to do fuel calculations as well. Uh, some operators also include bespoke applications that sit on the EFB, and these might be used to complement airline operation systems, um, so long as they reach the appro uh, relevant approvals, but they will also help um, uh, achieve the overall goal of EFBs, which is not just a reduction of, um, uh, of paper inside the cockpit, but also faster access to information, which helps lower turnaround times and reduce workload in the cockpit. And non-pilots may not understand the importance of that last part. Uh, many incidents of pilot error cite cockpit workload as either the main or as a contributing factor. So this makes EFBs not just an effective tool in reducing costs, but they also help make flying safer. Hardware categories have different names depending on which regulator you sit under and how long you've been in the business. Um, they're often used uh, together. Uh, so I've, used, I've included both here with some general characteristics. So a class one or portable EFBs, they're often small devices uh, and double up as corporate uh, devices at the same time. Uh, think of a small EFB, a small iPad um, with no connectivity to the aircraft they're then considered like a, a paired, a personal electronic device. And as such, they must be stowed for takeoff, taxi and landing. Class two, uh, these can be pilot or plane attached EFB. Uh, these connect to the AISD with um, uh, usually a one-way feed of data from the avionics. They can be integrated with the cockpit displays and their build is the responsibility of the operator. Quite often they are uh, small laptops with uh, operating systems such as Windows, and then uh, the manufacturer will provide the software which runs on top of that and connects to the systems on board the AIS. It's worth mentioning that class two EFBs have very different threat profiles, depending on whether they are plane or pilot attached. So our plane attached EFBs are considered part of the minimum equipment list or NEL and tracked as an aircraft part, they're always under the control of the airline with coordinated and tracked movements between locations. Pilot attached EFBs are not. They enter and exit the cockpit when the pilot enters or leaves the aircraft. They are very likely to connect to all sorts of networks in hotels, cafes and airports so that the pilot can update software, navigation databases, NOTAMs, read corporate emails, or even surf the internet. So you can see how the plane attached EFB has a very different threat matrix to that of a pilot attached one who may be anywhere in the world using insecure Wi-Fi. And then finally, um, I've, I've included class three for, um, for completeness because class three don't really form part of the AISD, but they are an EFB. So they are integrated into the aircraft control domain and they have no connectivity outside of that. The, the build is the responsibility of the manufacturer, but it is maintained by the operator. And what I mean by that is that the hardware is fixed. The hardware cannot be changed. There may be software updates over time, uh, but these are provided to the operator who then have the responsibility of maintaining the right version. Class three EFBs are certified as part of the avionics. So the operator has next to no ability to make changes unless they wish to go through the trouble and expense of recertifying. And even though EFBs, 
class three EFBs within the ACD, the ones I've seen are logically separated from the core avionics. And you have to interface through many different modules before you can bridge a gap between the control surfaces and the EFB. So attacking a class three FB to affect an aircraft in flight is still not that straightforward. Software categories. Uh, so type A, really simple. They're just used for the storage and display of documents only. And like I said, these are typically class one, class as PEDs and they get put away uh, during the critical case phases of flight. Type B applications, this is where it starts getting more fun. So like I said, they can perform uh, performance calculations and they may access the internet on the ground uh, and in flight. And they may be able to receive one-way data from the avionics. They are also the most common EFB software type I have seen. It's worth mentioning that class one and class two EFBs are built by the operator and as such, they are not the responsibility of the manufacturer. Even though they may provide some or all of the software that runs on the device, it is up to the operator to ensure that they are working securely. Mm -hmm. For EFBs running type B software, this is where things can get a bit blurred. According to regulations, any vulnerabilities in the software that could affect the operation of EFB software, regardless of who coded it, is the responsibility of the operator to mitigate. At the same time, details on any vulnerabilities do not seem to be passed on to the operator, just a series of recommendations for EFB security. Now these recommendations are really good, but as we'll come on to later, I don't feel they go far enough. Type C applications can affect the control of the aircraft in flight. So this is the really juicy part. Um, essentially, they can send data to the avionics. However, uh, at the moment of going to press with this presentation, there are no current approvals that exist for Type C applications that I am aware of. I have seen future offerings from some manufacturers about having a bi-directional connection between the EFB and the flight management system, which sits in the avionics. However, I have not enough detail there to give you the information about it. As I touched on on a previous slide, regulators provide operators with cybersecurity recommendations. Recommendations are also given by the manufacturers. But I feel that even when you combine these two sources, this advice does not go far enough. By that I mean that there is a lack of detail in what to consider and measures to take. When it comes to regulatory documentation, security appears to be the poor cousin, with the majority of the document dedicated to the physical characteristics and user interface design. The wording is also quite willowy and lacking in detail. It is certainly an area where I think there is a lot of room for improvement. Also, because implementing EFB security is the responsibility of the operator, some manufacturers appear to use this as a green light for poor implementations of technology, which on their own would be considered zero security by design. Instead, the security is designed to be assured by the inherent assumption that the operator's networks will never be compromised or that malware will never find its way onto an EFB. Kind of like passing the security hot potato. At the same time, operators are not directly informed of any vulnerabilities, instead given a set of recommendations to implement. Unless the operator discovers any weaknesses, they would be unaware of the risks involved. And if they were aware of the risks, I'm more than certain that they would have targeted controls to them based on what they knew. Overall though, the recommendations given by some manufacturers are pretty good. Although I feel there could be more detail in certain areas. I would like to share the document names and references with you. However, I am heavily constrained by NDA 
as well as manufacture efforts to protect IP. So I'm not allowed to give you these names, even though doing so would be for the benefit of any operators watching. And I cannot move on without briefly talking about class three or integrated EFPs. And even though they don't form part of the AISD, there are some use cases here which highlight a really important uh, issue when it comes to technical debt. So like I said before, the hardware is fixed and the software updates come from the manufacturer. So to an operator, it may seem a very attractive prospect in terms of time and cost to get an EFB running. However, this category of EFB is not without its issues. And an example is, is, is an aircraft, which I love, which is the, the Dreamliner. Uh, having flown it many, many times, uh, albeit not that long ago, I only started flying it about three years ago. I absolutely adore this aircraft. It is great to fly on as a passenger. But many Dreamliners have, especially the ones that first were uh, brought to market, have Windows XP operating system integrated in the EFB, which sits in the avionics. And this is a fact which gets a lot of surprise look from InfoSec and IT professionals. But hang on. Remember, the 787 was designed in 2002, 2003. Back then, XP was king and would be for many years to come. The type approval and first flight for this aircraft was in 2009. Vista was available, but come on, Vista, who would have changed? So when that aircraft was first went to market, it was delivered with EFP BP4, developed using Windows XP. BP5 is available now, which uses Windows 10. However, not only do the upgrades come with a huge cost in terms of the unit, but also a huge cost in terms of downtime and recertification of the avionics because it's a hardware change as well as a software change. So this kind of explains the issue of technical debt using more modern examples. Of course, we all think that an EFB on board a brand new modern state-of-the-art air aircraft should be the most recent stable version of an operating system. But even in the timelines that we're talking about here, which are very small, we're seeing out-of-date operating systems being used in critical systems because of these time lags. And this issue is not limited to one manufacturer. I just brought up Boeing because of the, uh, the knowledge I have of the BP4, BP5 uh, versions and the operating systems. But, and, and it's not even limited to EFBs. It is all across the aircraft. I just wanted to discuss the technology trap to those who may not fully understand why we see old tech in these brand new modern and state-of-the-art air aircraft. But it is interesting to think that the first Boeing 787s still have 20 years of life left in them or more. Um, and when they come to end of life, will they still be running EP4 with XP? I think some will. And uh, we'll see um, if Ken is still, uh, for Ken from Pentest Partners is still climbing around aircraft at, uh, in breakers yards in 2040 then uh, he may come across uh, Windows XP inside the avionics, uh, which will be a really, really cool thing to see him play with. Uh, but if you haven't seen their videos, they have some great walkthrough talk throughs on 747s, which are going through the scrapyard today. And they also have older videos on their blog about dismantling old IFE systems a couple of years ago, which have uh, 386 hardware inside them. And these are aircraft that were only dismantled a few years ago. So remember I said that e-enabled aircraft are flying data centers with half of it on the ground? Well, this is the other half, ground systems. And they're used for um, keying and rekeying the PKI on the aircraft. They're used, like I said, for the, the key thing is the uploading of LSAPs and FLS to upgrade software modules on board the aircraft, a major, major time saver. But they're also used for configuration changes, downloading of logs, and as a conduit for EFB connections. 
And this is done with some software provided by the manufacturer in a client server relationship. The idea is that the operator would implement a Windows server, which runs the server software, and then the client would be installed on the engineer's laptop. The PKI um, onboard e enabled aircraft is typically used to protect the VPN connection between the aircraft and the ground systems. It is also used to digitally sign the software that gets uploaded. So integrity checks can be done before it is, in, it is installed in the aircraft. And this is one area that manufacturers seem to have gotten right with the latest e enabled aircraft, at least the two main manufacturers anyway. While I do not have a PhD in cryptography or anything higher than a BSc in any subject for that matter, the PKI implementations I have seen are simply excellent. And that shows the manufacturers are learning from previous issues. And that's great to see. As well as EFBs, I think that ground systems require special consideration when it comes to security control implementation. The e-enabled aircraft being sold on the market today are truly excellent. Whether you're a pilot or a passenger, they are fantastic creations and a true credit to the teams involved in their development and manufacture. However, the same cannot be said of some of the supporting software. Some of the software distributed with modern aircraft is quite old and they were likely coded at a time when there was very little consideration given to secure DevOps or even cybersecurity at all. It seems that the approach back then was, so long as it works, it's fine. Um, and that has led to some very insecure software being used with modern day aircraft. However, I'm seeing positive movement in this area. There are new versions of EFB and ground system software being developed today, which should be available in a few years time. And that is going through what appears to be a sensible and secure approach to software development. So time will tell what comes out from that, but again, it's another positive move. As with EFB software, how many operators have looked at the ground system software from, a, from an attacker's perspective? Have they looked for weaknesses? Have they found any and then combined this with their threat model and overlaid on the existing network architecture? Remember, like I said, a lot of airline networks have any, if at all, any segregation. So if the corporate network was compromised, could someone pivot into the ground systems and put your aircraft at risk? Also, conversely, could this software and any weaknesses you identified uh, introduce new attack vectors or vulnerabilities in your uh, systems, which could then be used to pivot into the corporate network. These are all things that operators really need to consider and look at. Now, I have seen some manufacturers and third parties offer ground systems, a ground system service hosted in the cloud. And now, while I understand moving to the cloud is not the silver cyber bullet for any organization, although some seem to think it is. From my experience, these cloud solutions are normally put together very well from a security perspective. Um, they also permit creative design in methods to mitigate weaknesses in your software. So for example, if you had um, issues with the client software that would sit on the um, engineer's laptop um, and you didn't want that um, interaction with the server going across the network, then what you could look at is putting both the server and the client in separate lockdown enclaves inside a cloud solution, then implement a VDI to host the client interface through a secure HTML5 web front end. And that gives you lots of opportunities to customize the security uh, according to your threats and risks um, and, and all sorts of other opportunities as well. Um, so the, the, these are certainly ideas that we're looking at because the software isn't, that's available today doesn't seem to be that good, um, but some of the cloud uh, offerings are. Uh, flight attendant panels. So <clears throat> these are interesting uh, uh, from a cyber perspective. So anyone that deals with uh, uh, industrial control systems will know that these are essentially what's known as a HMI, a human machine interface. And these are used for 
lighting, air control, announcements, door status, lighting, emergency buttons, and then they might also have bespoke features that the airline will implement. They can also be used for maintenance and um, for uploading FLS, LSAPs, uh, and for uh, downloading logs um, if the uh, maintenance port is unavailable. So why do FAPs have a security focus? Well, like any HMI, um, especially those ICS implementations, they're typically an easy target, um, especially those with a USB port. I did some research on FAPs, and while some are directly connected to both the AISD and the PIESD in the enabled aircraft, there are none which have a connection to the ACD or avionics anymore. Not that I can see anyway. That said, I did raise concern about the possibility of a passenger inserting a USB stick loaded with malware into the FAP USB port and what that would mean. So the team I was in started asking the manufacturer some very probing questions. And to their credit, the manufacturer provided a highly detailed and impressive response. And it was actually done in person due to the sensitivity of the content. But what they showed us were that the technical controls to protect the ACB from the FAP were very robust. However, when asked the further questions, it seemed that the AISD was considered almost expendable in the malware on board scenario. When asked about that, the response was that the AISD can be entirely functioning and it will not affect the airworthiness, which can be interpreted as the AISD can be riddled with malware and the aircraft can still be operated legally. Fine, I thought. However, that got me thinking to the operational side, and I wondered how many pilots, knowing that an aircraft is infected with malware, yet still legal to fly, would actually fly it. What if, as an attacker, my goal was not to take control of the aircraft, but to affect the operations of an airline as a coordinated extortion or blackmail attack? Now, everyone in the industry knows, regardless of the airline, that this air USB port is off limits, even to free. Yet I have spoken to Cabot crew from multiple airlines and they have confirmed that they are told this in training. However, everyone in the industry also knows that this port is used extensively to charge crew devices, both official and personal, in spite of the rules. I have also seen passenger devices being charged in the FAP as the USB port in the seat wasn't working. And it was actually the crew who had done this as a courtesy to the passenger. So what is clear from this is that while people know there is a risk, it is clear the awareness training isn't working. Not all the time anyway. I thought it important to also include some detail on some of the more general issues I have found. And I must state again, I am heavily bound by NDA, but I have reached out for advice and agreed parameters of what I can divulge here prior to this talk. So one team I was in had been working on the secure des design of their EFDs. And we had planned project milestones to ensure that build documentation was accurate and that the device was built according to design. A lot of work had gone into locking the operating system down. It was Windows based. And this is where I had a lot of um, extensive experience and knowledge. So this is where I focused my attention. I knew that we had a pen tester who was going to look at it from the perspective of an ass hacker and oversee my work. So I left the software alone. This is the manufacturer provided software. I had naively assumed that the, this software would be fine or at least not too bad. When it came to the pen test, I knew the build was solid. So I was surprised when on day two of the test, uh, day two of the five day test, Andrew, pen tester call. Now, anyone that deals with pen tests know that if they call you prior to the planned end date and it isn't a question, then it's bad juju. Andrew had not only found an API that was completely unprotected, there was no authentication, there was no encryption, but had 
written some code, but also written some code to exploit it. Uh, I was quite shocked. So I sent a message to the manufacturer straight away and um, received a response that this was not a vulnerability, but in fact a feature. All I can say is that when I repeated this response to my colleagues, jaws across the room dropped to the floor. I took a step back and realized that in order to make the manufacturer understand, I had to do more analysis. Now, back when I was in the British Army, I was taught to analyze attack scenarios by asking, so what, until you reach the answer. So I took the same approach with Andrew's code and turned the dial to 11. I found every single parameter I could. At the end, it would not have taken much to turn that resulting code into a very feasible malware for EFBs. I spoke with flight operations, pilots, and InfoSec and demonstrated the rather trivial attack. Everyone I spoke to agreed that this was bad. So despite this feedback, which included a dossier of potential outcomes, which I had compiled from pilot and operations feedback, the only action taken by the manufacturer was to reduce the, the attack surface. They replied, in their opinion, the scenarios I had described were not feasible and the whole vulnerability was dismissed. Now, it wasn't like I was proposing aliens would come down and attack planet Earth, although 2020 isn't over yet. One threat which they dismissed as unrealistic was the insider threat. Now, I found that really strange because this threat was on the operator's risk register and I had been asked specifically to consider this threat when giving my updates to high level security boards. Consequently, sometime later, however, I was informed that the software in question was going through a complete life cycle upgrade. And that the project would include not just a secure DevOps approach, but security milestones with qualifiers as well. Now, I cannot take full credit for that change because I know that somebody had moved into a new role covering the security of such software, which means that they had already, already knew that there were issues and that they were moving to close the gap when I had uh, spoken to them about this, uh, this issue with the API. And I know this person from my dealings with a manufacturer and I'm very confident he will do good work. Further investigations I've made on other aircraft have uncovered examples of the same unprotected API. Different API, but unprotected all the same. And these are inside the AISD. So they are accessible from the EFB, they're accessible from other systems on board. And despite going through the responsible disclosure route as an independent researcher, I was not only dismissed for making unrealistic assumptions, but I had to fight for updates. Now, the assumption I made was based on a proposed commercial offering from the manufacturer, coupled with their own API documentation, detailing how it would work. Yet it was still considered unrealistic. Now, they may have made a separate assessment themselves and started going down a different, more secure pathway for the release of this new functionality, which would be great. But I was not made privy to the details, so I have to say that for now, I don't know. If I do find out more, I will certainly update you. So hopefully that has given you a sufficient introduction into a network domain that is often overlooked by security researchers, but which has a lot of juicy issues that need to be addressed. Like I said, attacks on the avionics are really interesting, uh, but getting access to them to exploit vulnerabilities is pretty difficult. While the AISD may not be as sexy or interesting on the surface, when you scratch a bit deeper, there's a lot to decipher. Touch points, while still quite difficult to exploit, are more accessible, considered more traditional to an attacker. And this means everyone from cabin crew to engineers, flight ops and infosec, all have an important role to play in securing e-enabled aircraft at the operator level. Um, some advice I'd give uh, to operators is do not take the security of provided software for granted. Now, obviously I'm not talking about FLS and LSAPs here. What I'm talking about is the software that is provided 
to connect to your aircraft, so for the EFBs, the ground systems, etc. Even the most modern aircraft today have some very basic vulnerabilities in the code. What is more, more worrying for me is that this software will have achieved some kind of approval in spite of these weaknesses. So don't assume because they have approvals that they are 100% secure. Make sure you perform some kind of assurance on software and systems, either using your internal teams, or if you don't have the skills in-house, hire an external air, uh, expert or pen tester. It may be costly, but having an aircraft AOG for several weeks while you investigate a cyber attack and have to replace all the onboard FLS or LSAPs could probably cost you a lot more. Security in the operations is not the realm of one department alone. The multiple business areas that make up e operations require that InfoSec understands aviation and what cyber risks actually mean to aircraft. InfoSec also needs to make sure that engineers and other business areas understand the risk context. It is a two way street. I've seen that some operators have implemented a multidiscipline groupings which handle these challenges. They're often called a cyber imputer cell, which is a really cool name to have on your or CV, just a little hint there. Um, so these groupings often have at least one board member and they combine knowledge and experience from multiple departments and they ensure that issues are tackled in the best possible way for the business. From what I hear, they are extremely effective and I would certainly recommend that you, if you don't have one already implemented in your business and you operate a email of aircraft, that you certainly look into it. And I suppose it finally goes without saying that you must involve your regulator as much as you can. They have access to the right people, the information and the frameworks with the right advice and the right guidance to guide you through difficult scenarios. So make sure you engage them as much as you can. And if you don't get satisfactory results from your regulators, um, sure, pop me a line. I can certainly help where I can. But finally, I'll sign off with a small piece of advice for operators. If you have someone in your organization who is as effective and competent uh, an engineer as they are with InfoSec and cybersecurity, my advice would be to make sure that person never leaves your business. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I, I, I was lucky I had access to excellent engineers um, who were able to communicate to me exactly what the problems were uh, and, and to better understand systems so I could evaluate the risk. Um, at the same time, these engineers were, um, they, they have a high level of intelligence engineers, so they, they could understand what I was telling them. And together we worked really well. But if you can incorporate that into one person, that's a very valuable asset indeed. So that's the end of your presentation. Hopefully that's enough uh, um, information to whet your appetites on the AISD. There is a lot more there. Uh, I had to cram it into 50, 50 minutes. Um, so um, I will be available for questions uh, in a session in the Discord channel from where you linked to this presentation. Please head over there and join in the discussion. Uh, alternatively, you can grab me on Twitter or on my website. There's a, a, an email link you can get on me. And um, I hope to uh, speak to you all soon. Take care.